in case uh, you haven't met us. Uh, Martin is an R Core and R Foundation member. Uh, he is has been on R Core since its inception in 1997 and is a uh, on the board of the R Foundation. He's also the co-creator with Doug Bates and maintainer of the Matrix package and a number of other packages uh, that are widely used. Uh, he's in a joint professor in mathematical statistics at ETH Zurich, and he's also the project lead of ESS uh, or Emacs Speak Statistics. Uh, I, on the other hand, am a frequent collaborator with, um, with our core, uh, arguably the most uh, prolific um, in recent times uh, in terms of feature additions to the R language. Um, and we'll go through some of the things that I've done um, over the course of a different section of this. So I'm not going to belabor them here. Uh, but this is just to say that I've interacted with a number of different R core members uh, quite a bit over the years. Uh, and so I'm bringing the, the perspective of the external collaborator uh, to this. So the goal here is to talk about and, and in part uh, how to contribute to R. So first we should talk about what this actually means. So our goals here are to help you learn how to help R by helping R core maintain R and thus benefiting yourself and us and the larger R community. The goal is not professional advancement, although depending on your specific situation, it's possible that will come. And it's not personal recognition or fame, although acknowledgement will always occur for any contributions that you that you do um, that you do help R with. And the reason that I say that is because there are much easier ways to become a recognizable figure in the R community than doing this. Um, and so if that's your goal, that's perfectly fine, but this isn't really a good way to do that. Uh, this is really about helping R and helping the R language and the R community, uh, largely from behind the scenes. So what we will focus on is what kind of efforts are actually helpful to R core and to the R language and how can we perform those and what kind of well-meaning actions are not helpful and how can we either avoid or improve those so that they will be ultimately helpful to, to R. So this is not the only sort of effort in this space that has or is happening. Uh, in terms of outreach from our the our core team and our foundation uh, to the larger community in terms of fostering these types of of engagements and and contributions, uh, so there have been a number of blog posts um, by Thomas Calabera, Luke Tierney, and the last one was also by Kurt Hornick uh, of the our core team. All three of them are on the our core team, um, talking about how you can help our. Uh, and thanking people, in fact, for the for the large and helpful response from the first from the first blog post. Um, and those are all really good reads. They're all relatively short, so I encourage you to go uh, and read those um, at your leisure. Uh, they they complement the types of things that we're going to be talking about here. The other major effort, which is ongoing, is the R Foundation forwards R kind of contribution working group, which is organized by Heather Turner. Um, it has the involvement of a multiple R core members, including Luke Tierney, Michael Lawrence, and Martin Plummer, um, and other fa R foundation members of which Heather Turner also is a member, uh, such as Jenny Bryan and Di Cook. Uh, and it also involves a number of sort of larger R community members and R ladies members that you might have heard of before, such as Kara Wu, Amelia McNamara, Toby Hawking, Michael Chirico, Brody Gassalm, and, and Sebastian Meyer, um, and a number of other people as well, some of whom are actually in the, um, you know, in the, the audience here, um, and that you will likely have heard the name of after too, uh, not too long. Uh, and so there are a few different outputs so far of this working group. One of them is actually this tutorial. Uh, but in addition to that, there's an RDevel Slack which currently has about 110 members. It's not super active, um, but it is a place where you can go and you know talk to other people who are interested in this type of contribution uh, and collaborate with them. Uh, and we'll talk more about how exactly that might be useful uh, over the course of this tutorial. 
Uh, and there's also work by Saranjit uh, Kaur, uh, who is in the audience here. Um, she's developing a, our developer's guide to uh, talk uh, more permanently about how to do a number of these things. And she's working with Heather Turner and Michael Lawrence on that. Uh, so that is being developed on GitHub. It's relatively early days now, but the, but the work is ongoing. Uh, and so that will be developed over the course of time. So before I talk, we talk about and get actually get our hands on, you know, some bugs and what to do about them, I'm going to run you through uh, some of the large parts of my history as a collaborator uh, with our core and, and my contributions to R and the lessons that I have learned uh, sometimes quite painfully over the course of, of many years of doing this so that we can sort of have those lessons up front for you so you don't have to uh, do the same types of things yourself. So it began when I was a graduate student and I decided that I wanted to be able to put that I had patched R, I had patched six, you know, successfully submitted to R on my CV, which as I said before, is not a good reason to do this. Um, but it is, to be honest, why, why I did the very first one. So, so in 2015 or so, Simon Anders posted a reproducible example of a problem where if you have a graphics device open and you call the identify function, which uh, identifies what point you're clicking on in an, in an open graphics device. Um, and then you call the function and you close the graphics device before clicking, it would hang R. Um, and so I, I sort of used a modern version of R uh, at the time. And I, you know, confirmed that I saw the same behavior. It did, it did hang for me when you did that. Uh, and so then I diagnosed the problem and I found it actually wasn't a problem and identify itself as a problem in the locator C function. And I had the, I had the benefit of already knowing the C API um, because I was working with Duncan Temple Lang, who is also on our core uh, as my thesis advisor. So I did have the leg up in that sense. And I was able to fix the, um, this bug uh, and a related bug in the locator function. Um, and so I submitted a patch. Uh, at that particular time, there was actually no response on Bugzilla, uh, which is not generally the case. Uh, but but I could I could see that the the changes I had submitted were actually sub applied in uh, trunk, so that that patch had been accepted. So that made me feel good, and I, I enjoyed that. Um, and, and then another one at around the same time was that Mark Brabington had wanted bitwise operations on raw vectors. Um, and so I saw this, uh, this post at around the same time. So I immediately sort of started digging around in the C code and, uh, that underlies the, you know, bitwise, bit W and bit W or all those, all these functions in, in R. Um, and I patched it to add support for raw vectors in there because it, it wasn't in there before. Um, and the reason that it wasn't in there before was actually because the normal and and or, you know, vector operations actually already operated on uh, raws. And that's that was actually the way that you're supposed to do that. Uh, and so it didn't need to be in the bit W functions in the first place. Um, but the 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 documentation to the bit W and in bit W or and such didn't say that, which is why Mark uh, didn't realize that that was the case and I didn't either. Uh, and so ultimately that patch was not accepted, um, because the bug was closed after a fix to the documentation that simply referred people to the and and or from the, from the help for the bitwise operators. So the takeaway points from this section are working patches are not always going to be accepted, even if nothing is wrong with the patch. And, uh, and it's notable that these patches that aren't accepted don't take any less work on your part uh, for the initial submission. And so what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, really consider before you start writing a patch is this patch and is this approach that I'm, that I'm taking here, the right one, the one that's going to help R the most and most efficiently with my time and with, with our course time. Um, and the other major takeaway is sometimes the patch that changes behavior is not the correct fix. Oftentimes a change to documentation 
is the correct fix to a particular problem, even if the issue is actually real. So the issue was real. The issue was that, you know, the bit y, bit w help functions didn't refer to how you're actually supposed to do that uh, for raw vectors, and now they do. And so that that issue is now fixed without any changes to R or C code. Okay, so even though I had like a fifty percent, um, you know success rate at this point, right? Um, so, but I was still feeling pretty good about myself. You know, I had I had code that was in R, so that was exciting. Um, and then we came to another, this, this book is actually pretty funny. Um, and so it used to be the case, if you called any logical operator um, with only one argument, it, was it would behave as negation. And so if you did the, the code that you see here with, you know, you take marks around and, and then true, it would negate true and give you false. Um, so that obviously is, that's a real bug. That's not what that should do. Um, and so I decided to develop a patch. Um, and then I submitted my patch. The, the details of this are not too important, but, um, you know, I, submitted my patch, I ran the code that was buggy, and it was no longer buggy, it seemed to work. Uh, and so I submitted a patch. And then, you know, I heard from Martin, um, you know, I had said that I had tested my patch because I ran the buggy code, and it wasn't buggy anymore. Um, and Martin came on, and he said, Well, you didn't really uh, test the patch because you didn't run ours tests, because some of them are now failing. So obviously the patch was not in a state where it could be accepted at that point because it, you know, it failed its tests now. Um, so that was not great. And the takeaway here is always test your patches. Every change is a change. And so anytime you touch anything, even if it's just documentation, you really need to run the checks and run the tests before submission. Um, and so that is something I'm going to say a number of times over the course of this tutorial, because it's very important to remember. Things can seem small, but you still run the tests every time. Um, and if you do make check the vel, that will actually run our command check on all of the base packages, which will also check the documentation, which is why I said even for a documentation change, you, you should be running these tests. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, there was a question to me in the chat about how to ask questions. And ah, I yes, think we a, forgot to mention that. Originally, did, yes. we said that people should actually most conveniently open their, unmute themselves and uh, say, <clears throat> or something and ask it, because that yeah. always works. And yeah. you have to be a bit brave. And yeah, otherwise... Please feel, free, please feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, to ask questions if anything's not clear. That, that is the most lively thing to everybody, right? Instead of typing somewhere and we have to watch this, the Slack and the chat and so on. Uh, we try to watch this, the chat and the Slack channel. Me, mostly the chat because that's integrated in Zoom and I'm used to it. But yeah. yeah. The best is if you open your mic and just ask, and please yeah. do that because it, it's boring anyway to sit in front of a screen instead of in yeah. the midst of other people. And so if we hear other voices, it's it's much better anyway. Thanks. So is there is there an actual question now other than how to ask questions? Meta question. <laughs> okay, well, if there is, again, please interrupt. Uh, you can also, I don't actually know what it will look like, but there's a raise hand button um, in Zoom, which you can also try. Uh, but yeah, uh, questions are very welcome. We're here to teach you guys, for you guys to learn this stuff. Uh, I mean, we're not here just to listen to me talk. Um, so whenever any question does come up, please please feel free, as Martin said, uh, to interrupt, uh, and we will we will get that question answered. So, uh, barring there being another actual question now, uh, we will get to the next stage, which is my very first feature edition, which zero people roughly know about or ever use, but it's still in there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and this is a change to how you can debug 
uh, things that are S3 or S4 um, methods, essentially. And so I, the, I added a signature argument to debug. So you can actually debug methods with debug instead of having to use trace. And there's also this debug call thing, um, which we'll actually maybe look at a little more later. But um, this is this is this is something that I've, I'm pretty proud of. The, you know, the first feature edition. Uh, but there are some things that you may not know about that if you had known about this in the first place, which again you probably didn't. And there's no shame in that because basically no one does. Um, so some things to keep in mind are that I worked with Michael Lawrence at Genentech as our job, like as our as our day jobs um, at the time of this, and he had just been elected to our core. Um, and there also is literally about a 20 plus comment conversation on Bugzilla about this patch. And there are four distinct different versions of the patch that I developed over the course of these, these discussions and these iterations. Um, and some more things to know are that I actually disagreed with Michael and Martin about the design API for debug call. Um, I wanted it to actually run the call, whereas Michael and Martin preferred that it not run the call, it just actually set the debugging, and then you can run the call later if you want to. Um, I preferred that it, that, would, that it would actually do the call, but of those four patches, um, the second, third, and fourth, all of the ones after the first one, implemented their preferred API rather than mine. Um, and that's because they are the ones on our core. They're the ones that are actually going to own this code once it's once it's been accepted, if it's successful. And so they get the final say always on on what goes in. Um, it was accepted, but unfortunately not until after feature freeze for that release. And so it actually remained in our devel for basically an entire year. Uh, before it was actually in any release versions of R. It is now in release versions of R because this was a number of years ago. Uh, and the final thing is that the patch was still further refactored by Michael in the process of, of putting it in. And these are all things that, that they're going to happen, right? Like this is not, there's nothing wrong with this. This is, this is, this, this is the process working correctly. Uh, sorry. What is feature freeze? Right. So feature freeze is something that software uh, software projects will typically do when they're about to release a major new version. Uh, sometime before that, they will have what's called feature freeze, which means no new features are going in. Only bug fixes to changes that have already been made are going to go in between then and the actual release. And the reason that that we do that is so that Anytime you add a feature, there's there's a much higher probability of adding bugs uh, if, if it's a new feature or major changes to code. And so basically you want a testing period where you're not doing any disruptive changes. You're only testing the changes that you've already made to try to make sure that there are as few bugs in there as possible. And so that's what feature freeze is. And it's usually, um, Martin, what's the, what's the actual timeline for R? Is it like two weeks or a month? before release well, is feature freeze? Yeah, see there is this once once a year um, minor release in some sense, it's major because it only happens once a year. And those have a period of even four or three or four weeks of feature okay. freeze. Whereas the, the patch releases also have a very small, like one week uh, feature freeze period. And by so, the way, um, if I may mention that, Gabe mentioned the three blogs on, on our blog. And the third, the last one was just uh, earlier in spring this year, where, where we asked, or actually looked in, and Thomas Colibero said, please test R. And that was exactly during the feature free, freeze period, where we say, okay, in a month, there will be the new version, R410, right? That was in April or in March. And then this is basically the next version of R because there will no, not be any new features because we are in feature freeze. So please test now. If there is any bug we could fix before release, we would be really grateful. That, that was the whole topic of that uh, third blog post that, that Gabe mentioned 10 minutes yep. ago. 
And in fact, I, I, I should have had slides to that effect. I don't, but like that is a major way that you can help R without any, you know, without touching code ever, right? Is not very many people use R Devel or the release candidates, which is what it's called between that feature freeze and the release. You have what's called release candidate R versions. Um, and not very many people use these because most people use R in production to actually do their job. But any code that you can run in these release candidate versions of R to see if things are working is extremely helpful uh, mm -hmm. to the R core team and very appreciated when, when that's done. So I encourage you mm -hmm. to whatever extent you can to be testing R develop generally, but at the very least, these release candidates, because that, that is a very impactful, helpful thing that, that you can do that will help the R project. But yeah, that was a that was a good question. Um, there, you know, there's Thank no you. reason that people would know that um, if if they're not already involved in in software releases. So that is what a feature freeze is and why why we do them. Um, any other questions so far? Okay, so we'll go ahead and keep going. Again, um, anytime you don't understand something that I say, a term that I use, uh, just pop in and, and ask the question. We're happy to, to clear those things up. So the next thing is, if you have heard of me, uh, this is probably one of the things you've heard of me for, uh, which is the Alt-Rep framework. Um, it's, the, it's the single largest sort of thing that I have helped contribute. Uh, I, I, would, I don't want to say I put it in because it's uh, very much a collaboration and, and Luke was was on the lead because it was such a big, such a deep change. But um, I did do the proposal. I proposed Alt-Rep at the DSC, which is um, the Directions in Statistical Computing. It's a it's an invite only con research conference slash R core meeting. So that's the that's the meeting, and it's typically attached to UseR uh, when you know when UseR is actually in person. Um, there will typically be a you know many of the um, our core members will go to use R and then, so then they would be around and they would have their meeting. Um, and they, they have it as a, as a conference. So they have talks and stuff. And I gave a talk, uh, when it was in Stanford in, in 2016, um, where I proposed what I didn't call it all rep. I called it cost back for custom vectors, but, uh, what eventually became alt rep, I proposed that in 2016, I had already been in contact with Luke before the meeting. And so I had sort of informal interest in something like this, if I could sort of, um, have the right proposal. Um, and then this was such a big change that, you know, the, our core actually voted on whether this was a good idea, as far as I know. Um, Although I think Luke thinking it was a good idea sort of affected many people's votes as, as that's, that's, we'll talk more about that later, but that's basically how things generally are. But uh, it was accepted as a, as a, as a plan, as a way to move forward. Um, and this was an enormous internal change and something that, that is notable that I'll talk about a couple of times is, um, you know, the very first two words in the title of the talk were backwards compatible. And that was the only reason I think like the fact that it was backwards compatible was the only reason that they could even possibly consider a change like this. Um, so, uh, over the course of, you know, 2017 and 2018 or so, um, that that's when alt rep was, was Ill implemented. Alt rep is in now, um, you know, as our users, you wouldn't necessarily have ever interacted with it. Although if you use, for example, Vroom, the Vroom package by Jim Hester does use alt rep, uh, under the hood to get some of the speed ups, um, that it, that it gets. Um, so I had a proof of concept, uh, which was a sort of a window, a vector that was a window into part of the data of another vector without copying it. Uh, and it worked, I was able to do that, uh, but it didn't respect ours copy on right semantics, which Luke pointed out as soon as I showed it to him. Um, Luke implemented the alt rep framework. Um, I contributed code. Some of it is still there. Some of it had bugs. And so it was either not accepted or was taken back out. Um, and that happened a couple of times. And ultimately Luke uh, asked Michael, who I was still working with at the time, 
to review my code internally before I submitted it to him. And that, of course, at the time was extremely difficult, um, painful for me to hear. But ultimately, it was understandable. You know, Luke is very busy, and these were very big and very deep and very important changes that were being made. And any bug that got in would be quite damaging to R and to our users. Um, and so we just couldn't have that happening. Um, and so, so he did ask, he did ask that that, um, be done, but that wasn't me being kicked off of the project. You know, I still continued to be involved and I still have submitted several patches, which implement our further various support of for alt rep in the R internals, uh, some directly to Luke, some to Bugzilla, which then are often reviewed by Luke because Luke is still sort of the point person for that kind of thing. Um, and so I have continued to be involved and continued to, you know, contribute meaningfully, um, even after, you know, it was that extra step was asked for. And so the takeaway here is that code that's submitted to an R core member really should be very mature. Um, and this is difficult to do, right? If you're, if you're sort of early in your career or you're, even if you're late in your career, if you're early in your career for, of this type of work you know, it's hard, right? And code review can be painful and needing to be reviewed can be painful, but it's a great tool to get better. Um, and so I encourage you both, and if you, anytime you're writing software, uh, whether it's, you know, patches to R or pat your own packages or whatever, you know, it, you should view code review as a, as a tool to get yourself better and to get your code better. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that our core collectively has very little time um, spread across their own work in improving R and their day job duties um, and all of the collaborations and all of the patches that they're considering. Uh, so that's something that we as, as external contributors need to be cognizant of um, and keep in mind. So near the end of the alt rep times um there was a there was another post by michael chirico on our devel um pointing out that if you have a uh, you know matrix with thousands of rows and thousands of columns if you call head on it um you get six rows and thousands of columns right which is sort of not what he really wanted in that case um and so he actually had asked like that it just not do that uh, but that would be an extremely non-backwards compatible change. But I responded on the mailing list with a proposal essentially for a backwards compatible version where you could optionally be slicing a rectangle rather than, um, you know, a strip of rows. Um, but that the, you know, that the pre, that the existing behavior would be preserved if you didn't do anything special. Uh, so then Martin, uh, you know, responded quite favorably to, to that post on the mailing list. And so I, uh, over the course of time, um, I, I designed and proposed a patch. Um, it passed all of ours tests, right? Because I had learned that this is something that you need to do. Um, and then, uh, and so that was good. And I had done sort of what I could do to test it. Uh, and then you know, Martin responded on Bugzilla because we were on in Bugzilla at this point uh, that there was quote quite a bit of breakage on CRAN end quote. Um, okay. And yep, um, I, I can tell you right. So because I took your patch and put it into the into the R sources, uh, it was my responsibility, and and of course I did not run the sixteen thousand CRAN packages to see if they still pass all their checks but the CRAN team somehow did after it was in our devel and they get back to me, yeah, well, there are these 20 CRAN packages that now no longer run their checks correctly because of the change that you, Martin, put in. That's why I, then I came back to you. That's how right. it works. Right. Oh, you um, know that, but the audience probably wouldn't know that. Right, yes, yes. thanks. Um, mm -hmm. And there are, um, I know, I think Luke actually yes. has, a, Question following Martin's comment. So what kind of breakage was it, Martin? Was it the fact that 
some people were using head in code that actually expected all the columns or in other words, was it big default? Norris, I'm getting older. <laughs> Honestly, I forget. And I didn't I, it up. I, I uh, do remember. Well, actually, okay. I don't remember. I looked at it again uh, in the in the in process the of Godzilla. preparing Godzilla it. is really a good archive of things that happened, yeah. by the way. And that's interesting in itself. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that, that broke was something, and we'll get into this a little bit, but it's something that I didn't consider at all, uh, which was people were calling head on expression objects. And I had no idea anyone was going to be doing that. Um, and so my new code didn't work in its initial form with expression objects. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there were things like that that broke. Yeah. Um, and Not so like, only expressions. Basically, people used head just to say, I want the first six elements. And they, that would work on any or objects yeah. that allow subsetting. And so expressions is just one of them that... Yeah, and then I think yeah. your code basically assumed atomic objects or even something like an array or something. I forget. Yeah, I don't remember what the initial yeah. version did, but it didn't it didn't work for that. Um, yeah. It does now, like the version that's in there now um, does work for sure. expressions yeah. and, and everything else. Um, yeah. But but yeah, the the initial one, uh, I hadn't even thought to like test if it would work on expression objects because I don't call head on expression objects generally. Um, so, but some people were, and, you know, luckily, in fact, they had tests that would break if it didn't. Um, and so, so yeah, so then. Um, about that. Yeah, I'm just ahead. wondering when you come across something like that, so you, you've worked out that, um, you, you know, some people are using head on expression and it's not what you expected. Um, what did you do then? Did you just say, right, I need to make it work? Or did you go back to our core and say, you know, sh should the CRAN um, package maintainers fix their package? You know, who, who has to change and how do you decide that? Yeah, well, that, so, that's a good but... question, Heather. Um, with this typically discussion, either with, the, with me and the CRAN team, if I put it in, or even within our core. Uh, sometimes we say, okay, this actually, but here, um, I think even I, I basically decide on my own, no, this shouldn't have happened because basically the old, the old help page for head and tail, right? There is also the tail function, um, basically said, this is just a more convenient way of saying, uh, bracket one column six with the default head, uh, yep. the argument six. And so bracket one column six should continue. I mean, this should continue to be the same functionality, even with the extension. And yeah. and and also the news entry that that we put in for for the change said this is back compatible. And back compatible really does mean that it should work for for everywhere where the bracket indexing works. Yeah, but and that in, was in general, you know, Heather. You're right. Sometimes we come back and say, "Well, there are a few packages, and they they use bad programming style, as we see in this part of the code anyway." And and rather, they we help them change their code because we think that an incompatible change is much more important than back compatibility. But that is rare, as Gabe mentioned. Back compatibility is a, is a big thing for such, in some sense, not mature project as R is. And um, and the other thing that I will say from my side is that I had intended it to be backwards compatible. So it was a, it was a bug on the part of my code that it was not fully backwards compatible, and I had not sufficiently tested it because I hadn't tested it on things that I didn't consider people would be would be using head and tail for. Um, and so another aspect of of the answer to your question is, you know, that Martin at the time requested that I not refine the patch and submit uh, a new version of the patch because he was iterating on a local copy to track down and break these fixes. Um, and so I had the, the, when you give code to our core and our core decides that it's going in, like you're giving them the code It's their code now. Right. And so often, you know, if they think it's it's a good enough idea or a good enough fix, but it doesn't quite work, they'll come back to you and say, please, you know, please fix this, please change it in this way. But sometimes they'll say, 
you know, it's just more efficient for me to iterate. Like this is a good base for me to start on. And now I'm going to get it into the state where it's actually ready to go into the sources. Uh, and so Martin actually did that in, th in this particular case, at least at this point in the story, he, he said that he was going to make some changes and that he was going to, um, to continue that work so that it would be ready to get in. Um, and he did. And so he got the, the breakages fixed. Um, and then, um, another person joined the, the discussion on Bugzilla, um, named Suharto Agno, Agno, Agno. Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, he suggested num numerous changes to the patch, uh, which was quite frustrating to me at the time. Um, but he did, he correctly identified multiple flaws in the initial version of the patch. Um, and he also suggested a number of different sort of implementation approach changes, some of which Martin agreed with and some of which Martin didn't agree with and, and stick, stuck with my original. But, um, but the takeaway points here is that patches are not your baby, right? That's not what's happening here. So when you are contributing something like a patch, um, the goal is to make the patch as good as possible, regardless of who touches the code and, and, and ends up with the final design of a particular piece of it. Um, and critiques can feel like attacks, especially if, you know, the language you're speaking isn't the first language of someone who you're interacting with, um, that can affect the, the communication. And so you can feel like you're being attacked when you're really just trying to help. Uh, but it's important to remember that better patches make R better uh, and, you know, learning from this type of critique will make your patches better. And sometimes you don't get it right the first time. And so when you're iterating, being open to this, this type of input and this type of review is important. Uh, and the other thing to, to know is what we, what we talked about, which is that it is often easier for our core members to make changes themselves rather than to accept or, or iterate on patches. Um, and that's something that we should keep in mind as well. So our core, I have found them to be uh, quite open to, to collaboration. Um, and you saw that I've, I've been pretty successful, you know, getting both bug fixes and even new features in. Um, but it is essentially the case oftentimes that our core or whatever our core member you're, you're interacting with is doing you a favor in a sense by, you know, taking your patch and vetting it rather than writing the code to do it themselves. Um, and so, you know, I've found them pretty happy to, to do it and to engage me in this way, but it is something to, to keep in mind that a lot of people don't realize. And this is, I've seen other open source developers from other project, big projects talk about this too, where it's actually like, it's basically a service that they're doing um, when by sort of interacting with patch submitters rather than just fixing things once they've been identified themselves. Um, and so it's, it's a really valuable service because it helps the rest of us sort of up our skills so that we can contribute more and contribute better um, in the future. But that is that is something that they're doing that sort of a lot of people don't realize. Um, and then so the final sort of big thing that I have done, uh, which was just quite recently, and it's actually still only in our develop, um, is uh, uh, so there I, I made a significant, like quite large speed up to duplicated and unique and any duplicated for alt reps that know that they're sorted. Uh, you know, on the order of like tens of tens of um, of times speed up, you know, 10 to 60, depending on the situation. Uh, so this is a very large chunk of code. This is hundreds of lines of C code. Um, and I partially or fully implemented this entire thing multiple times. And I tested it and I fixed bugs in my implementation and I wrote an extremely exhaustive testing script that had every corner case that I could possibly think of. And this was all before the very first submission of this into Bugzilla for consideration by an R-Core member, right? And so this was a large, large amount of work for me to do, right? And, you know, in the past I had, like that had happened in the iteration process with 
the R core member that I was working with. But for this one, I really wanted to try to save them the time of doing that and me, you know, the pain of having to like give them something and then have it be bad and then try to improve it. And so, you know, this took me months of not working on it full time, but coming back to it and looking at it again um, before even the first time it was submitted. Um, but then once it was passing all my tests and passing all its own tests and all of that, and it seemed to be pretty good. And I had refactored it to be a cleaner implementation of my initial design and all of that. I submitted it. Um, and then I waited. Um, Luke, who was the person who would normally consider this type of thing, was focused on the native pipe, which I'm sure you're all familiar with that has just been added to R recently. Um, and so he didn't have time to closely vet hundreds of lines of unsolicited C code, which is essentially what this was. Uh, and so it, the patch sat in Bugzilla for, for a long time. Um, and, you know, I, I, I pinged Luke, I think once uh, or twice, and he said that he had seen it, but he didn't know when he was going to be able to get to it because he was, he was focused on, on other things at the time. Uh, and that was nothing personal. Um, he just, you know, Luke is a professor. He has teaching duties and things like that. And he was working on another pretty big change, which was this native pipe. Um, and so he just didn't have the bandwidth. Uh, so then Michael Lawrence came uh, and he contacted me. Uh, and then he and I collaborated on getting the patched in. Uh, he asked me to formalize the test script into unit tests, which I, in retrospect, should have done. Um, but ultimately, we got it in. Um, we had hoped that it was in time before feature freeze, but it didn't end up being in time before feature freeze. Um, and so uh, it's in our devel now. So if you if you check out our devel and you give duplicated a sorted vector, it will be much faster than you expect. But again, we're sort of in a waiting game where you know it's going to be you know from the time that it went in, it's going to be a year before it actually is in an anyone normal release version of R. Um, and so the takeaway points here is that sometimes, many times, I think, uh, a suggestion or patch not being taken up has nothing really to do with the suggestion itself, especially if it's unsolicited. Um, it just, our core are, are very senior people. Uh, they have a lot of draws on their time. And so sometimes there just isn't the time or the bandwidth. Um, Another thing is don't submit significant code changes without regression tests. This is true of, of everything. So you shouldn't really be submitting significant changes to R unless you've heard that you should from R core anyway. But anytime you submit, submit significant changes to anything that you're working on, any piece of software, uh, you should add regression tests to make sure that the, the changes actually work and do what you wanted them. Uh, and the last is just to be patient, right? Like if you've heard that um, that something that they're going to get to something, generally they will get to it. Um, but it can take a long time, depending on what the thing is, what else is going on. So occasional reminders are okay, but nagging is really not going to help you any. You're just going to annoy them. It's not going to magically make them have more time than they had before, right? Uh, so they're not ignoring you out of any sort of malice. They just have other, like, it's in, like, Luke has, like, I think he has, a, like, a list of priorities of what to work on in R when he has time to do that. And, you know, this patch was somewhere in the list, but it wasn't at the top. And so he was working on the, st on the stuff at the top of the list. So the overall takeaway, so that's that's been a run through of my history, a history of a sort of recent external feature submissions uh, to R. Um, I obviously have not added every single feature that was added by an external member, but um, a lot of them were me uh, in recent times. Um, so the takeaways is no one's perfect. So you don't have to be Luke Tierney or Mark Martin Meckler to contribute to R, uh, as you saw by the numerous mistakes of mine that I just walked you through. Um, but when you're when we're collaborating with our core it's our job to make as little work for the our core member who's collaborating with us as possible um 
and we need to always be respectful and not demanding of their time. Because again, remember, it's sort of counterintuitive, but they are, in a sense, doing us a favor or doing us a service by engaging with us for these types of things, um, especially with how busy they are. Uh, and I mean, they have stuff, stuff they're interested in working on, like they have stuff that they'd like to do in R themselves. And so they're taking time away from that to, you know, work with us. And so we should, we should keep that in mind and be respectful. Um, another thing to keep in mind, uh, which is difficult for some people to accept is sometimes the answer is no, even if you still think something's a good idea. Um, and even if something actually is a good idea, which is different than you thinking that it's a good idea, the answer can still be no. Um, and if that is not something that you're going to be able to accept, this isn't the right game for you. Um, this isn't, it's not going, you're not going to have a pleasant time of this um, if you sort of aren't able to accept a no from our core because you will get them. I get them. Everyone gets them because sometimes the ideas are bad. Sometimes the ideas are good and the bandwidth isn't there. Like there are a lot of different reasons. Uh, and never shoot from the hip, right? Each change is the change, which we talked about before. And so always test the things that you're submitting um use make check devel before you submit to anything to bugzilla any sort of patch uh submit some form of testing or confirmation whether it's a test script that the r core member who's considering it can run themselves and design tests from or formal tests but formal tests are actually not trivial to design and so you have to be sort of confident in your ability that you're actually designing the right tests before you should do that. But at the very least, a script that you were running as when you were developing this to sort of confirm to yourself that it's doing the right thing, submit that as well. And uh, a note here is if you don't have a script like that, your patch is not ready to submit. So that's something to keep in mind. So contributing to R. So now we're going to actually talk about the contributions um, that you know people like us can make. Um, so first off, confirming bugs. This is this is one of the things that uh, was asked for by R Core um, in the in the first of those blog posts that I mentioned. Um, basically, just is the bug real? Like, can you still see it? So, start up a, a development version of our R Devel, uh, run the code that's reported to be buggy, and does it actually give the behavior right? Like, do you actually can you confirm that this is a thing? Uh, particularly if you're on a different operating system than the initial reporter was, this this is actually quite useful. Uh, the next step after that is generating reproducible examples that only use base packages. So a lot of times sort of inexperienced bug reporters will just take whatever code they were running that gave them what they think is a bug and like paste that into the bug report. Um, and generally, like almost no one uses only base R in their actual work. So generally that's gonna have a bunch of external packages in it. And the functions in those packages are gonna to call to other functions in those packages or other packages. And they're gonna, eventually they're gonna call something in R, like in the base R language, uh, but there'll be multiple layers on top of that. And none of those layers are helpful when we're actually trying to diagnose or fix a bug in R itself. And so taking that, and translating it into an actual reproducible example that only has base R code in it is an extremely valuable uh, thing to do. Um, and if you can't do that, then it's probably not a bug in R. It's probably a bug in one of the base packages that was being used. So, next step above that is careful bug analysis. And this is actually extremely, extremely useful in, in, in some senses, more useful oftentimes than patches to, um, mm -hmm. to our core members when they're trying to fix. Because remember, the goal is not our achievement as individuals. The goal is to make R better and to fix problems that are in R. And a lot of times this is, this is something that is really, really useful. So basically 
once you have this sort of small example, you look at it and you debug it essentially, right? Like this is debugging in the same sense that debugging your script or package code is debugging, you're debugging R. Um, so basically start from the thing that happens that's a bug or that shouldn't be happening and figure out as much as you can about it. Uh, what functions are in play? How are they interacting with each other in a way that isn't useful or isn't by design? Um, and, and here are some of the functions. Uh, so you've got trace back and options error recover, which is my personal favorite. Um, but you've also got debug and debug once uh, because not every bug is going to cause an error, right? Some Sometimes actually worse bugs are bugs that just give you back an answer that's wrong, right? Silently wrong is the worst thing that uh, that software can be. Uh, and for that, error traceback and error equals recover are not going to be helpful because there's no error. So, um, so then you're debugging. So then you're going to be using debug or debug once or trace. Um, another thing um, is that, that we didn't add here is you can do warn equals to, option warn equals to, which converts warnings into errors because sometimes there's a warning, but there's no error. And you can force that to be an error. So then you can debug it like as if it was an error. So that's another mm -hmm. useful thing. Uh, and Martin added a, added a hint there, which is this ls.str. Uh, which is often often quite useful. So now I'm going to stop talking for a little bit. Um, and we're actually going to get our hands on a bug. This is this is a real bug that is from the version of R that we asked you to come prepared with in the Docker container. Um, so please start your Docker containers that have version 3.3.2 or somewhere around there. Um, it looks like from what Martin added here, it was fixed in 3.4.1. So anything between 3.3.2 and 3.4.1 is fine. But the Docker that we gave you instructions for has 3.3.2 in it. So start that up and then run the code that you see on the screen there, that histogram call. And we are going to go ahead and put you into breakout rooms now so that uh, you can actually do a code analysis. Okay, so welcome back. Hopefully uh, that was fun uh, for you guys. To, this is a real bug. This is this really happened uh, and was really fixed in R. Um, and so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, what went on. What you know, what what you guys found, and then anything that that didn't get found, we'll we'll walk through. Um, there. I will also tell you now um, that the initial report for this bug was extremely high quality. It was extremely well done. Um, and Martin has the the bug number. So, you know, after, if you're job. interested, um, mm -hmm. you can look at the report, um, which did a really well done, really exhaustive um, bug analysis uh, without a patch, but that was still extremely helpful um, when Martin uh, went in and, and fixed it. So, um, so this is what you guys should have seen. Um, you know, there's a warning. Um, and then Martin did the additional thing of, of doing a, a trace back. So trace back will um, sort of give you the last error. So the, the, the call stack for the last error. Um, in, in reverse uh, order. So um, I guess we can start with what uh, what did people find? So uh, we asked uh, people in the breakout rooms to sort of have it have one or more speakers uh, that were going to talk about what what they found. So um, so this is a more sort of interactive thing. So if, if someone wants to step up and just uh, talk about what they what they found, mm -hmm. what their approach was, what they found. Um, we, we can go from room two, three, sure. four, five, the four rooms, maybe. I don't remember the number. <laughs> that's, okay, yeah, that's, room two that's was LRK, Gavin Lee, Gregory, Dorochi, Luis Revilla, Sancho. Mitch, I can Pedro. start then. 
Uh, it was a lot of fun. So thanks a lot for finding this uh, very good exercise as an introduction. Uh, it was quite a rabbit hole, I would say, just looking at the pretty function and then looking up N class ended up uh, looking IQR. And I think we've finished uh, looking at the quantile default in the stats package and trying to figure out where this rounding or, or well, or floating point or whatever kind of error might have happened. And one line that looked a little bit suspicious and we did not really grasp why the FOS variable was four times dot machine dollar double dot EPS. And that's when time was up. So we did not manage to debug this further. Okay. That's, uh, that's fine. Again, you know, we, this is, uh, this is not something that happens in the span of, you know, a half hour in real life. Right. Um, which is another way of saying, don't submit a bug report if you've only thought about something for half an hour. <laughs> uh, it should take longer than that. Um, but I did, I did hear a number, a number of the things that uh, that were ultimately right and were ultimately, um, you know, related. Uh, so thanks for for that. Um, I think we'll go to the other rooms and see what they found, and then I have some slides that will walk us through. Mm -hmm. Um, so what room, really happened? Room three was Andrea, Gilardi, Christophe, Derieux, Corinne Fay, Naras, and Nick and Philip Paymans. Yes. So uh, we went to basically the same rabbit hole. Um, and, but first of all, we read the documentation for histogram and tried uh, seeing where, what, what caused the if a change in parameters could help uh, isolating the source of the error. So we tried uh, the same vector with different methodologies and the same vector without this rounding error here. So uh, after that, we ran down into uh, nplus.fd, which gave us a gigantic number for our vector. Yep. And I think that we we didn't uh, conclude that it was a problem in the interquantile range. We thought that the methodology was reasonable, uh, correct. And then uh, we started discussing what should happen if the breaks uh, parameter receives such a large number. Because since it's a, such a large number, the as integer uh, function, uh, the as integer call in the pretty function, was the was the, the moment it crashed. So we dove, dived into into the source code, the C code, uh, all up to finding that the the problem was indeed that the number was way too large, and then uh, understanding that as the true problem, we started a very interesting discussion on where should it be fixed because we imagine that we shouldn't change it at the C level, like make it tolerant for numbers larger than the integer maximum, or what happens if R uh, switches to integer 64 in the future. So where, where should this uh, fix be addressed, which I think was the the most interesting part of that. Great, well done. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so the Ruth, next room is yeah, go ahead. Heather Turner, Jonathan Keen, Lambda Moses, and Pantelis Karapan Giotis. Do you have a speaker? Yeah, I, I can do it. Um, yeah, so. Um, uh, initially, we, we realized um, that uh, obviously you have this factor where, where you have one integer that, uh, that, one, that has one number with a, a very small epsilon added. And if you coerced it to integer, there wasn't a problem running the function, but, but with that epsilon, this, uh, it caused this problem. And, um, and then we, we found, um, uh, you know, through the 
we did some debugging and, and realized that uh, this was causing uh, the number of breaks to be very large. Um, and so we, mm -hmm. we dug down and uh, into the nclass.fd function uh, to see why we were getting this large number of breaks. Um, and we saw it was because uh, the interquartile range was very close to zero, but not exactly zero. And we noticed that the, um, if it was exactly zero, then um, there was a, a sort of block of code to handle that particular case. Um, but it wasn't exactly zero, so it was skipping that and going to the next block of code um, where the division by this number near zero um, was causing it to return a large number of breaks. So um, so we think that's sort of the, the, the root of the problem and we discussed possibly changing um, the, uh, the condition that the interquartile range was exactly equal to zero to perhaps a condition with the interquartile range being less than some some tolerance as a, as a possible solution um, and, and then we took a sneaky look at the at the real code uh, or the, the current of today. code mm. of today yeah. <laughs> and uh, but I, I won't talk about that because I think you're going to so yep. great um, and then the, the last room, some people left uh, the room, but they're still here. I think Laura was there because she was sharing the screen. When I was joining, there was Saranjit Kaur and Fungi, and there was someone else who else have left. Yeah, hello. Yeah, maybe I can talk for this one. Saranjit, mm -hmm. let me know if you want to. No, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think at the end, we kind of did the same way of debugging as Ezra. We uh, did a trace back and then we realized that the uh, issue was coming from pretty the default and actually more uh, a bit upfront that the, the number of breaks were probably not computed correctly. Um, so we also went to the uh, nclass.fd function and and then there we saw that the, the interconnect range was very small, but for us also it made kind of some kind of sense. Um, and so at the end, that actually we indeed found out that um, if we were trying also to reproduce this example, but without the small numbers, there was indeed some way around implemented within NCLAS of AD. Uh, and then the question was still, uh, where should this issue be fixed? Uh, should pretty the default be able to handle a big number or should this be fixed in NCLAS of AD and uh, set a different number of breaks? Uh, all these yeah. mm -hmm. Great. Um, so yeah, that's a really good job, uh, everyone. Often, um, if I can, go ahead. I can add something. I think something interesting that we discussed is as in class that FD is implemented based on a paper from, if I remember correctly, 1926. Is if no, no, eight, 1981. It, oh yeah. So yeah. So if uh, if this works on a theoretical level, but not inside the computer, should we you fix the function? Should you still keep the model from the paper? So yeah, it's kind of a, I think a more broad question, but it was interesting mm -hmm. to discuss a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a very good, um, and that's a very good observation. And we, we will just, Martin will talk some about that in just a moment. Um, mm -hmm. But, before that, we will go over. So I think um, across all of the groups, sort of collectively, um, all of the major pieces were um, were hit. There we go. Um, so just I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, so the issue, the sort of proximal cause, is um, pretty dot default complains that it got an invalid n. Um, right, so it, it has received a value that it didn't like. So what does that mean? Um, what is n doing? So can anyone tell me what n in pre.default actually is for? What does that parameter do? Uh, and the reason I'm asking this is when you're when you're talking about behavior of a function being buggy, it's very important to know what the function is supposed to be doing at any given time. 
because a bug is only when it's not doing what it should be doing. Um, and so does anyone off the top of their head know what that end is? If not, that's fine. Um, I can I can answer that. But that is that is just one of the types of questions that we want to ask ourselves when we are when we're debugging. Like it's it's easy and fun to dive straight into code, but it's also uh, a good idea to sort of make sure you know what should be happening at at any given stage, so that you can ensure that it is what happens. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll go just go ahead and answer answer that. Uh, so n is the number of breaks that you want to be made pretty, um, because that's what pretty um, does. It it basically finds breakpoints that can be printed nicely um, that aren't like scientific notation with like tiny epsilons added to them and such like that. So. It's a number of breaks. So ultimately, we got a number of breaks that it didn't like. Um, um, Gabe, sorry, Pretty is, I've spent many days of my life for, with Pretty to improve it in the history for. So N is an approximate, a suggestion for yeah. the number. And it must be that. It cannot be the real, the, the, the final number is often different than the one that you give it. Yeah. Because the real important thing is that you get very small decimal numbers with very few digits and, and so on. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. Thanks, this thanks is so much. important. So, it makes the whole pretty function in itself very interesting and very challenging. Yeah. But the interesting thing, as you said, uh, in the end, it's not the pretty function that has, has any problem. It just shows the yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah. So thanks, Martin. That's uh, so things like that are also important, right? You know, the difference between this is the number of breaks and this is the approximate number of breaks is an important one and in some cases um not in this particular case but in in general that is very important um so in, in what sense was the n invalid well we have a warning which helps us understand that um so if you if you look at the output that was actually given um there's an error which is the thing that we're ultimately trying to debug but underneath the error you'll see that there was also a warning that was raised and the warning mentioned NA is being introduced by coercion. Uh, and so that gives us a hint. It doesn't tell us the answer, but it gives us a hint about the type of invalidity that N had. Um, so there are a number of different things that when you converse the, con, uh, convert them um, can cause NAs. Um, and so we don't, at this point in the slides, we don't quite know which kind, but we know it was one of those things. One of those things has happened at some point in this process. And often when that happens and it raises a warning, it means that the code didn't expect that to happen. And that can often be involved um, in the ultimate problem, which it was in this case as well. So then as many, many, uh, I think maybe all of the groups found, um, but at the very least many of the groups found what ultimately was happening that is that n is just enormous n is extremely large um and it's being passed for so if you look at the trace back it says n equals breaks so now we have to figure out where this was called from which you know i think everyone found was in the uh, hist dot default function which is a method of hist uh, which was the function that, which is a generic function that was ultimately called. So his.default um, has breaks and that breaks is being used somehow, but we passed breaks equals FD, which is the character to, to hist, which would this then pass to hist.default. But by the time it's getting into pretty, it's not a character, which would have also caused an dynamic by coercion, but that's not what's happening. So if we look, if we debug pretty and look there, we see a really big N, not a, not the string FD. Um, and so what's happening there, there's a switch statement inside of his.default that basically switches between the different algorithms for automatically deciding how many bins it has. Um, and one of them is FD, which is the case that we're in. And I, I 
So one of the groups experimented with changing breaks to the other um, to the other algorithms and saw that they did not have um, problems. Um, but FD did, and so that means, and that caused a call to n class.fd, which at the time of the bug report and in the R versions that you were using looks like this. This is the full code. Um, so what's the problem here? Um, the problem as we saw it, uh, as, as was mentioned by uh, a number two, at least of the groups, two or three of the groups, um, was that well, so H is the interquartile range, um, and H being identically zero, exactly zero, is handled by this special case, um, and then it's handled again. Um, so if H were zero, then it would take the mad or um, mean absolute deviance, um, and then if th that is greater than zero, then it does something. If that is equal to zero, then it returns one. So you get one, the n of one. But uh, as Heather mentioned, and as, as the other uh, groups found as well, if it's really close to zero, but not zero, these special cases, these sort of protective defen uh, defensive programming measures are not hit. Um, and so what's happening in this data is that you get a very close to zero, but non-zero H. And then you're dividing by that number um, in that, inside that call to ceiling. And when you divide by something that's really close to zero, you get something that's really close to not zero, like very big, right? Um, and that's what's happening here. And so this is ultimately the place that the bug was. Um, so the bug was that if you have an interquartile range that is exceedingly small, but not exactly zero in the implementation of Friedman Diaconis, um, it explodes the number of, it explodes N in pretty, which explodes the number of bins that the histogram attempts to make. And it says, pretty says, no, I can't, I can't do that. Um, now, another thing that you could have done um, is if, so if you look at the, the bug report, the, the actual the vector that we're using, you know, you see that one of those um, ones has a epsilon, as, as Heather said. Um, you can make that epsilon smaller and see what happens. And if you change that to like, I think it's negative five instead of negative 15, uh, in the in the exponent, um, what will end up happening is that it will not throw an error, but you will get a really ugly histogram, right? Um, and so that is an indication that it's that's another way of arriving at the fact that this is really the inter like the this little epsilon here is is what's causing the problem. The net epsilon ends up being because of the well constructed example vector that the original bug report had, um, that epsilon is actually what's driving that, and that epsilon is driving the interquartile range. Essentially, what's happening is whatever that epsilon is, is the interquartile range for this vector. So you can actually wiggle that epsilon around and actually see what happens with the different interquartile ranges. Um, and you get some really funny things, like you'll get a, you'll get a histogram that has like, 80,000 bins in it, and all of the data is either in the first one or the last one, um, and and things like that. Um, and so that's another indication that like, yeah, the code didn't throw an error, but this is also probably not what the person running the histogram function wanted to get. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so as we found, it's ex it's dividing by an essentially zero, but not actually zero number. And that is driving the bug. So what now? So a number of, of the groups uh, arrived at that point and then started thinking about what to do then uh, and realized that, well, that's pretty complicated, actually. 
so I think I'll leave. Uh, Martin is the resident expert on on these types of things. He knows much more than me, so I will let him talk about exactly why that is complicated. Yeah. Anyway, so many things were said already. The goal is still an, an n class functions uh, to find an optimal number of histogram bins. So the mathematical statistics behind and uh, also in, in Friedman Diaconi's paper was how should histogram the number of histogram spins should be such that the histogram is as close as possible to the two underlying density function assuming there is a smooth density function. So that's the mathematics behind it. But by the way, where this power of minus one third, so that's n to the minus one third when n is the number of, of uh, observations. That's basically the Friedman Diaconis paper is derived is n minus one third and the factor that you should need. Uh, well, anyway, there, there is one philosophical remark that I want to make be, uh, here below. Um, well, of course, you cannot see my my. Do you mouse. want me to? Do you want the no, next it's, slide? It's, no, it's fine. Um, no, no, not yet. So I'm an extremist because I always find well, this time somebody else found such problems uh, because this sentence here, published algorithm, almost never take into account the most extreme boundary cases. I've learned this as an R developer. I didn't know this uh, 20 years ago, but it's a fact. Uh, and here it's the epsilon, you just have to vary. And, 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 and the other fact, uh, which actually, if you, if you ever take time and go to the bug report and the analysis, I, I've, I talk about this also. The problem, uh, interquartile range is a nice, well, easy to explain, robust scale measure, right? The, the standard deviation is not at all robust. And for histograms, for histogram rules, it's important that one outlier in your data does not determine the histogram bits for everything. So you want a, a robust scale, and the IQR is a robust scale. Okay. Uh, and, and so continuing here, fact is that software implementations of algorithms and the publication of an algorithm is really not the same thing, even if the publication is reviewed and so on. And actually, Freeman Diaconi's paper was not publish of an algorithm. It was publishing a quite mathematical paper on how to optimally choose the number of bits. But even, even when algorithms are published, typically people forget such things that the IQR can even be zero. That's actually the next slide, which I can now sh show to yourself. The original function for quite a few years, as I say, this was introduced in R in 2001, actually from the mass package where it was written well, at least in the last century, just looked like that. So here they didn't use the IQR, they just did it in, in things in two steps, quantile of the 25% and 75% quantile, and then the difference of the two values. And they may use as vector to get rid of the names, which, uh, and, then, and the rest, of course, you, you see that's the same, and then it was ceiling. So the case equals zero, as I write here, uh, is, is wasn't even taken into account at all, right? Uh, so if the interquartile range is exactly zero, H is exactly zero, you define by exactly zero, you get in an inf. And so that's what I say on the next slide, actually uh, not dealing with the case when H is exactly zero was even originally in R. And so actually I changed that in 2007, when then afterwards the body was changed and, and at the time we had the IQR function, or at least I decided to use it because it's more easy to read, that, that if H is zero, then I try the math. And if the math is still zero, then we get one as somebody already. I mean, so that was a version before the one that you uh, dealt with. Yeah, and here, the, by the way, is the link of the, of the bar report as well. So the problem is still, and then later we I already at that time made this difference myself of H still being zero, but I, I forgot that, of course, yes, uh, that is, if it's very close to zero, it's an explosion here. And that's why we got this report uh, then later. Um, yeah, so that was the story. I mean, the, the, the error message pointed to pretty being at fault. And, and it's natural to think, well, pretty should be able to deal with with any n in some sense, uh, but that is not the case. I mean, we really, 
Um, pretty was not touched at all in the solution to that bug because if people ask for for a number of pretty points that are larger than the number of atoms in, in whatever, uh, then you forget about it. And you forget even, I think, even computers in 10 years probably wouldn't want this large number of pretty values. So any any questions about any any of that? Um, either either the code analysis part or the you know specific the mathematical statistical issues that that Martin was talking about. Uh, yeah, Lambda. Um, so um, actually, another thing we noticed uh, was that look, so uh, so initially, yeah, like uh, yeah, we we're a group that talked about the um, epsilon, um, and uh, so it's also tried like a uh, plotting hist uh, for like just one, 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 two, and then I with the bricks equals FD, then we got like just one giant bar in the histogram and. Um, yeah, that, that's for our 3.3.2. And, uh, but then I, yeah, I also try to plot like the same thing. Um, yeah, like a with or without like a one plus that epsilon thing in the mm -hmm. R 4.1. And uh, but then I got like, uh, then I got like a two bars. It just, it's so different. Yeah, also we, we looked at the the um, new version of that, like a uh, n class that D function in uh, in R four point one is quite different. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more than just like a uh, tolerance thing. Yeah, um, may I say something to this because I I, I did all the changes that happened since. Um, so so it's still the thing that we need a robust scale measure, as the statistician says. So IQR is in principle a good choice, but we have to deal with the case when it's zero. And when it's very close to zero, as Heather mentioned, it's basically the same as being uh, zero. And so, so the first solution was actually one that I've learned a few years earlier about smoothing splines, and which was my PhD topic, well, not quite, but related. The idea of just rounding the numbers so that the epsilon becomes zero, uh, but rounding in a reasonable way. Uh, and so that's why the first solution also in the bug report was just instead of x use signif of x comma and then a number. In the end, we used five. So that makes the all small epsilons to be zero and the big epsilons are still kept. But that was not the only problem to solve. And that's why, why Alamda saw that there were more changes, because I said, if the use of, of the MAD instead of IQR was actually not such a good choice, even though it was also me who made that uh, seven years earlier, as I then found with the bug report, and you can all read that in Boxilla, it's all there. Um, because the MAD very often is also zero, and then you get to the last case where you just give n equal one, and so that was not so good, and then it was improved just a week later after fixing the bug formally. I added this extra case where I replaced the IQR by the difference of not the first and the third quartile, but then octiles, the first and the seventh octiles, or the first and the fifteenth, sixteenth tiles, and so on, and I went all the way to 500 or something and only gave up after that. So less and less robust, still robust, so one outlier would still work for large rain. Yeah, this is, so in the end, this was really interesting. It was about how to do, get a scale that is robust, that does not easily get to zero. Robust in a different sense. And that's why, it, by, by the way, Lambda, I disagree that it's completely different. It, it's just in this special case, it does something extra, an extra effort. In all good cases, it gives the identical thing. But of course, if you if you round it the numbers, uh, then uh, you have the difference between one and two, I think, because of the other change. Yeah, yes, we, then we have. We, I think we should go on because there are many more things that Gabe and I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, but there are more hands raised. Yeah, so there, I can't. Or you're right. I, should, uh, I can't see your, your name because your camera is showing, but. Um, Gavin Lee and Saranjit Kaur. What was the first one? Gavin, Gavin, Gavin. Lee. Yeah, that's me. Great. Um, so, so. Yeah, so. Just uh, more of a zoomed out view. How would you write this sort of bug in the scheme of bugs that 
um, have been come across in the last couple of years? Like, is this, would you class this as a relatively minor one or is this, you know, a really big rabbit hole? In terms of the effort to solve it yeah. or in terms of the impact? Um, well, so, I mean, Martin may be able to speak from the, uh, from the R core side, like I chose this particular bug because it was complex enough that it isn't like the solution isn't going to be immediately apparent. And also another thing that was a really important takeaway is determining what is causing the problem doesn't always immediately tell you what the solution is. And this, this bug is an example of that, whereas mm -hmm. Martin just mentioned, you can have a really good code analysis and know exactly what's going on in the code to cause the breakage. And still, like, you have to do something else in order to figure out how to fix it. Um, and that's something that's very important for us to keep in mind when we're when we're interacting with bugs. Like, a lot of times, for a lot of bugs, those two things are much closer together. They're, like, figuring out what the problem is and knowing how to solve it are, are, are very close together. But sometimes they're not. And keeping that in your mind as you're doing these code analyses and knowing that the code analysis is enough to be very helpful without necessarily having the additional knowledge required to to know what the right thing to do is um, instead is still really valuable. So that was, that's why we, um, that's why we chose this bug. Um, it's non, it's non-trivial in that there were a few steps that we, that we were seeing that, that we had to follow to get to where we needed to go. Um, I wouldn't say it's incredibly subtle it, it, you didn't have to, like you could go down into C code to see what's happening. There was a call, but ultimately, the issue wasn't in C code, which is more complex to debug um, and would have taken longer than the 30 minutes that we were going to give you. Um, but but yeah, like I, I chose this particular bug for its teaching value. Um, but I would say it's there are many bugs that are less complex than this. And there are some that are quite a bit more. Martin, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I agree. Uh, and about the, the seriousness or importance, in some sense, hist is, is one function that even beginners of R use, right? It's one dimensional data visualization. So in the very easiest and very first thing that for some, it's the first graphics they do. And so if the hist function sometimes gives an error instead of producing a plot, that's that's one thing. On the other hand, you, you have to choose the FD, which is not the default choice. And so in that sense, it's not, it, that's why it has taken so many years before it surfaced. If FD would have been the default choice, then it would have surfaced much earlier. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So there was so another this, question by yeah. Serenjit Kaur. Kaur. Uh, yes, so we, were, we tried uh, giving default values to bricks. So we tried uh, 3, 5, 10, 10, 100, uh, and we were getting the histogram with two, two plots, uh, getting far, uh, two bars getting farther away. Uh, so uh, what I wanted to ask is in such extreme value cases, uh, how is the software program? Like, how do you arrive to the number uh, where uh, after which this is going to break. So there was that seven point some number e raised to some really big number. So how do you arrive to that point, uh, to that number? Well, so in this particular case, the breakage was caused by an NA. And so it's controlled by what can and can't be coerced into an integer. Uh, so it was, if you, if, if if the number that you ended up getting is larger than the maximum integer, the 32-bit integer, then it was coerced to NA, and that causes Pretty to throw an error. Uh, anything smaller than that, you get a histogram that just looks really weird. Um, and and so, you can, in the, in the worst case, you can get something that takes a very long time, yeah. and then you get the very ugly plot. So the error, as, as Gabe mentioned earlier, uh, getting an error message is much better actually than, than getting no error message because you're just below the, the and you're still right, the, the maximal integer is two to the 32, which is about 10 to the 10. And that is very large for plotting. And so it takes a long time, I think, if you get 
just be beyond that boundary. Yeah, so we are, I think, going to to move on. But if yeah. it, you know, after the session, if you want to spin up the Docker again and and do the thing that I mentioned, where you actually still have the epsilon, but it's just smaller, um, you can actually see that. Yeah. We'll see what 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 Martin is describing. Uh, so we're gonna try to um, keep going because we have some slides to get through, and then uh, we have a special guest coming for the last half hour martin lawrence will be joining us um, and then uh and then we will have a um have a round table where you can ask us sort of any questions um that you that, that you have so hopefully um hopefully we can we can still answer anything that you're still wondering about more generally um at that at that time so um right so Submitting bugs. Um, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. It's basically the same as basically you should do everything that we just told you to do to other people's bugs to your own bug before you submit it. Is that's that's the extremely short version of of this section. Um, so with the addition of confirm is present in our devel. So if you're going to submit a bug, you need to be running a, a recent version of the development version of R to ensure that the bug is still there. Because even if it's a real bug, if it's not in our devel, that means that it's been fixed in the time since the release that you are currently using. And so we generally don't need a bug report for, for that. Then confirm that it's in R itself, like we talked about before. Um, isolate it to uh, the smallest example you can, again, like we talked about before. Uh, and uh, one thing that I will mention is I encourage you to look at the bug report for the bug we just explored in Bugzilla, because that is an extremely high quality, extremely helpful bug report by the initial reporter with a very good code analysis, the same types of things that you guys were just doing, written up really well in a way that was really helpful for Martin when he was looking to, to solve it. Um, then search Bugzilla to make sure that the bug that you're talking about isn't already reported. Um, and so here's here's how you can do that. So you can search for substring if you were talking about the substring function, um, for example. And then you get this list of a number of bugs that have been closed or are open um, that relate to that somehow or mention it in comments. And so basically, even if a bug your exact bug isn't um, isn't in there. If you if there's a bug in the same function that sounds similar, it's likely related, and so you may just have another case of a bug that's already reported. In which case, you can add it in a comment to the existing bug report. Um, and it takes some practice to know when two things that are related versus not. Like I said, the first thing that I did, I actually fixed two bugs with one fix because they were secretly the same but they were two separate. I believe they were two separate bug reports because it wasn't clear until you got down into the C code that that's what was happening. So if you don't already have a Bugzilla account, you will need to get one. Um, basically you contact Martin um, and he is in charge of giving yeah, people. No, contact the official address. I'm one of two volunteers okay. yes. currently who-, who... You, you contact the address, which will go to Martin. <laughs> And 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 Depayan uh, and Depayan Sarkar, um, and yeah. one of them will will get you a bug, Bugzilla account, and then you then you can submit. So next, we're going to talk about maybe you're thinking about patching, like you know, making a patch for a bug either that you're reporting or that you have seen. Um, so this is what I understand, and after numerous interactions with them and working closely with um, with them, uh, what our core's engineering philosophy is that you will be interacting with, okay? So first off, backwards compatibility is very important. Um, it doesn't mean that they will never ever change behavior, um, even non-buggy behavior, but it's extremely rare. And most of the time, if it's not, obviously buggy, the behavior is not going to change. Even if they would agree with you, 
even in the case that they agree with you that if they were writing it now, they would do it differently. The fact that it does what it does now is in the Bayesian sense, a very strong prior in of what it should continue to do. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're talking, particularly when you're thinking, oh, I wish this R function did this instead. Maybe I'll write a patch to do that. If the instead changes what other people's code is going to get that they already wrote, that they wrote 10 years ago, it's probably not going to happen. Um, and the reason for that is because there are so many people that use R for so many different things. There are lots of R scripts that are run repeatedly that haven't been touched in years because they just continue to run and breaking those would be extremely costly for our users. And so they're not going to do that without a really good reason. Another thing which took me a long time to really sort of understand why they felt this way um, is anything that can go in a package should go in a package. This is fundamentally what our core feels about how R should evolve. Um, at the very least, as a testing or maturation stage, but almost always actually just permanently, it should just stay in a package. And an important detail here is that popularity and like widespread use in the R community is not a counter to this to this feeling on on our car's part like it could if there were something that every single person that ever used R, they all loaded the same package that still wouldn't necessarily be enough for for it to actually be in R. and no one there's no package that every single person uses so um but there are packages that are ex extremely widely used but they're working fine as packages and so really changes to R need to be need to be such that they can't happen elsewhere um and another thing is that our core um operates on a sort of individual initiative plus lack of opposition model um which basically means there there are different aspects of the r code that are basically sort of shepherded and owned in a sense um, by different R core members. Um, and that they that person basically if that person wants to make a change or likes an idea that's coming from themselves or from outside and agrees with it, they'll sort of often pitch it to to R core. Um, but basically the you know, unless someone else gets really upset and really pushes back strongly, they are left to their own devices to, to do the things that they think um, are good in terms of accepting patches, in terms of, you know, adding features, in terms of, of any of that. Uh, so generally, that means that convincing one R core member is usually enough um, when you're talking about a patch or, you know, a, a feature addition. Um, because unless other other members feel really strongly that one person is going to be the one who would ultimately do it. Um, just a few more things. Uh, there won't ever be any more recommended packages, uh, most likely. Uh, I heard I have heard that directly from from Luke. Um, and the reason for that is that there's really not very much upside because our recommended packages are not part of our source code, so they're not tracked in the same way, but they're bundled with R. And so that dichotomy is just sort of logistically unpleasant and it doesn't really bring that much benefit. Um, and so again, popularity of a particular package isn't going to change that. You know, the, the packages that we like to use as users, we can just get them from CRAN. It's not difficult to get them from CRAN. And that's how it's going to be. Like it's, they're not going to, be added as recommended packages. Um, proposing new features creates work for them. This is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, even if you submit a patch and even if the patch is good, they still have to vet it, which is a, you know, that scales in size of patch. And I would argue probably doesn't even scale linearly in the size of patch. Um, and so this is still work for them. Helping squash bugs saves them work. 
even if you don't have a patch. So with all this code analysis stuff that we've been talking about, sometimes, especially if there's no patch, if you just have a really good um, code analysis, that can be extremely helpful mm -hmm. for them. So for your own sake, don't start with feature additions um, because you're going to be disappointed because they probably won't go in. Um, don't submit packages, patches, which change existing non-bug behavior without directly hearing that they are interested in you doing that. Um, and not liking the documented behavior is totally allowed. Disagreeing with it is totally allowed, but that doesn't make it a bug. Um, and so it's not going to be treated as a bug. Um, it's going to be treated as a feature addition, and it's probably going to run afoul of backwards compatibility and then not be considered. Don't expect quick turnaround on wishlist items. Um, Wish the items are really useful to our core as a way of collecting ideas for where R can go in the future, but they're also essentially unfunded mandates. And, you know, they basically behave like every unfunded mandate does, which means like they'll get to it when they can get to it. Um, and this one, I've, I just put this in here for completeness. I've never heard of anyone doing this, but um, if, if you're talking with an R core member, that's sort of the relevant person for whatever you're doing, and they say, no, don't like, try to find another R core member to say yes and overrule them um, because it's, it, it's not going to work. Um, it doesn't work out that way. This is different than engaging and even disagreeing with R core members on like an ongoing discussion on R develop. That is very valuable, provided that it's being done respectively, uh, respectfully. Uh, and I do encourage all of you to um, subscribe to the R develop mailing list and, and engage in um, in the discussions that happen on there. Um, so we are, yeah, we're running quite a bit behind. Um, Martin will be joining it, or Michael, I should say, will be joining us shortly. So we're gonna try to go through this pretty quickly, um, but these slides are available. They're in the same repository that the instructions were. So you can look at them uh, at your leisure and edition. So typo fixes are always welcome and appreciated by our core. Usually you don't even have to write a patch. If you just send mail to our devel pointing out where there's a typo and what it should say, you will almost always very quickly get a response back saying essentially thanks fixed in our devel. Um, and that's true of the of the manuals. That's true of the help pages. Is any any documentation? Larger changes to documentation are somewhere thing that we need to be careful. Um, really, only want to do this when it's necessary or when our core has solicited uh, such uh, such a patch. And it's important to keep in mind that it must be at least as technically correct as the old documentation. Um, which means that we can't trade clarity for approachability or, or approachability for correctness. Things have to be fully technically correct. Uh, and this does mean that you have to deeply understand whatever function you're trying to essentially write new documentation for. Um, and that, that can sometimes be difficult depending on which function we're talking about, which is not to say like clarity and approachability are very good. I'm not saying those are bad, but they need to be an addition to correctness rather than at its expense. So code patches, always view the actual diff file that you're going to submit before submitting it and never submit anything that has white space only changes. I say this because I have done that and Martin was not happy with me when I did that. Um, so just avoid that. And it's easy to see that it's happened if you actually look at the diff, like the diff file that you are submitting. Um, Consider updating documentation to reflect any change that actually warrants an update in documentation. Um, always test the exact diff file that you're submitting. Um, this is another one of those every change is a change situations where if you just make one tiny thing, you're just like, oh, I'm just like adding a comma in the documentation that I wrote. I don't care. Run, make check to Bell again. Um, because you can you can accidentally make the RD invalid, which will make it fail, which will cause work for for people. Uh, so it takes a little bit of time to run make check, but it's not that bad, and it gives you this protection against doing that. And always provide a test script or or code that tests your patch that that our core can run and themselves and look at 
as they're considering the patch. Avoid bundling enhancements with bug fixes, even if the enhancement is related to the bug fix. Those should be two separate patches. Um, similarly, avoid bundling multiple separable bugs, bug fixes. Those should also be separable because, again, betting these patches doesn't scale linearly mm -hmm. in their size, right? And so reviewing two separated bug fixes is much easier than reviewing just them smashed together because now they have to look at a larger piece of code and make sure they understand how each of the pieces are interacting with each other, okay? And avoid breaking backwards compatibility in every in any way, essentially, other than fixing what's obviously buggy, um, incorrect behavior. Uh, so feature additions, wish lists items are great. Uh, if you have an idea for a change in behavior of R that you think would be beneficial, um, filing a wish list item doesn't cost you very much. Uh, you should describe it, you know, well so that so that R core can understand. Uh, that's appreciated. So they have sort of all of these ideas collected in one place that they can look over. Um, there's absolutely no guarantee of it happening. Um, Sometimes it won't, often it won't, but sometimes it does. And that's a, that's a really good way to sort of get your ideas into R, even if you're not at the level where you're able to, to make a patch. Uh, unsolicited feature additions generally don't do this. Um, just for your own sake and theirs, again, um, there's a good chance that it won't be adopted. Um, and, you know, we don't want you to waste your time. We don't want you to waste our course time. Like we don't want anybody to be wasting their time. So, um, if you have an idea, bring it up on our development mailing list or in Bugzilla as a wishlist item and see if there's engagement from our core, see if there's interest from our core. Um, cause if there is, then that's a sign that it's, that you could collaborate with that person on, on actually getting that in there. So. For solicited or you know confirmed interest behavior additions, it's great to collaborate and voice your opinion, but the R core member is going to have the final say. Like I talked about with the debug call uh, function, you know I disagreed with their their design choice, and theirs is the one that's in there, and there's a reason for that. Um, be prepared to refactor your code possibly multiple times before submitting it. Uh, this is just good practice generally for software. It takes longer, but your first pass at anything isn't going to be your best one. Um, so I've often heard, you know, engineers that are solving a new problem talk about, you know, okay, so you solve the problem and then you throw that code away entirely. And then you start again with the understanding that you've gained over the course of that first implementation. And then your second implementation will actually be good and actually be ready to, to go in. So that's something that I'm not saying that's a hard requirement, but it is very useful. So you should consider doing it. Test it to within an inch of its life and then keep testing it after that. Um, and if possible, have someone else technically skilled at R review it before submission or before each of the iteration steps. Uh, and that Slack that I mentioned that the, that the R contribution working group um, has, has created is a good place to do that. I hang out in there. Sometimes there are other people in there. There's not much activity yet, but that's a good place to sort of meet with people. And Martin also mentioned something, uh, which is like even po pair programming when you're dealing with bugs uh, can be can be helpful and useful, um, and I encourage you to to do that. So you know you can collaborate amongst each other and like with other people that are interested. In addition to collaborating with with the R core member that you'll be working with. And finally, in the last couple of minutes uh, before we just open the ground, open the floor to questions, is um, so about purely speed up patches generally avoid them. Um, and the reason for this is that often when you talk about a speed up patch, you're, you're, you really, you're not going to have the impact that it might seem in isolation that you would. And so you really need to be confident that A, that you're speeding things up without slowing other things down. Uh, and that can often happen. You can speed up a special case, but then you know, something else has changed and you're, you're actually slowing down a more common use case or something like that. Um, 
And also keep in mind that speeding up code usually makes it more complex and thus less maintainable. So there are places in R where you could make things faster, but they're fast enough already and they're more maintainable and more un understandable in the form that they are now. And that's a conscious choice that, that our core sometimes makes. Um, and that in your own code, even outside of R, you should consider making as well. Uh, so premature optimization is bad. Um, and so you really only want to speed up if it's going to make a realistic, real difference. So two examples here, if I make something that takes two nanoseconds, take 0.5 nanoseconds instead, it's a four times speed up, which is very large, but it only massive. It only matters if you're doing this like hundreds of millions of times, right? Like otherwise, congratulations, you went from a non-detectable amount of time to a non-detectable amount of time in terms of like actual people. Uh, on the other hand, if I take something that took 10 seconds and now I make it take seven seconds, that's only a 1.4 times speed up, but you're going to save people's actual time, more of their time, right? You've saved three seconds. Think about how many times the thing in the top example would have to be run in order for it to even take three seconds total, right? It's a lot. And most things aren't run that many times. So micro benchmarking is a useful tool, but it's also extremely easy to misuse uh, because really at the end of the day, what, ha what matters is how long the entire script takes to run. And speed ups that are valuable, speed ups that that they will consider. And I like I have had speed up only purely speed up patches that have been accepted. These are the ones that are going to be in this bottom category. They're going to save actual time, uh, and also preferably don't make the code too much more complex than it is now. Um, and then it's really valuable, and then it's appreciated. But it's. It's not something that you that that should be sort of at the top of the list unless you really sort of are comfortable with the code and know what you're doing and 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 things like that. And I think that is where we will we will stop uh, the slides. There were some more slides about navigating a checkout, and we did have another practicum um, scheduled, but you know we had more questions, which was which was great, um, and. Um, and so I will leave that as, as homework. Um, the, the, the bugs that you can look at are, I've added them to the, uh, to the readme on that repo that, that we linked you to. There's a number of them. You can do as, as many of them as you're interested in. Um, some are old and fixed. Some are actually still live, um, including one in, in debug call, um, which uh, Sebastian Meyer found and then left unsolved for you guys to actually get uh, get a look at first. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Is my did Michael? No, I don't know here. if Michael. He's here. Okay, he's so here. Michael is 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 here as well. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and open the floor to any questions that you have for for Michael and uh, Martin who are uh, our core members uh, or for me uh, from the side of collaborating uh, frequently with, with our core from the outside. Are there any, are there any questions about? Oh, oh, forgot, it was one of your uh, suggestions also not to change the indentations because I remember that's a really important one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> not to change which? Change indentations when you sub submit patches. Oh, and yes. That, that is a good point. So that's related to this whole no white space changes thing, right? So one type of white space change is indenting changes. And that will sometimes even happen automatically if you're using RStudio or Emacs and you have certain configurations. It will, you hit tab and it does something, right? It indents your code somehow. Uh, but anytime you're submitting a patch, you need to be using the same indentation scheme that the R sources use. And Anytime you're modifying code, you can't be changing the modification scheme. And so that's one of the things, that's a good point by, that Naras is, is raising. That's one of the things that you should be looking at when you look at the diff um, is, you know, is the end, does the indentation and coding style gen more generally fit with what's already there? 
or not. And if it doesn't, then you need to make some more changes so that it does uh, before you submit. So that is that is a very good point. Yeah, and I, I may add something, Naras. That in, there are a few places in the both R, R source and C code sources where the current indentation is wrong according to the scheme because a previous patch or even a change by R core without the patch tried to do a minimal change. And so let's say you have an indentation by four, as we often have, uh, and then a, an extra clause, right? Another level of, bra of braces with another if. And then sometimes people or I in the past used a two indentation for this intermediate clause. So all the other indentations would not change. So that the change really only were like four lines instead of 15 lines where 11 of the 15 lines were just indentation changes. And uh, some rare times we kind of reworked and, and do uh, fix the indentation to our own styles and then have an only white space commit, right? That's sometimes possible if, if the indentation is really bad and then one change does nothing change but indentation. That's kind of okay because the commit machine says, I only indenting, I do nothing else than that. But if you fix a bug that is really important changes in four lines, and then changes 20 other lines just by indentation and other white space, then that's really bad. Because if you look at the, the change, then you don't see whether things really happen because you are kind of diverted by white space changes in the diff. I don't know, at, at least I'm sure Nara has understood what I meant. I hope some other people do. Okay, so I have just uh, I, I have one question. Uh, how relevant is it for us to review whole bugs and say, you know, I can still reproduce? Or uh, I, I think if we say this is no longer a bug, maybe it helps. But is it helpful if we go over all the all the bugs and say, yeah, I can still reproduce it, like I don't know, five or seven years later? To what extent is it? useful to review old bug reports? Um, it is useful. Uh, after uh, Initially, remember, uh, Gabe showed you the three uh, R blocks that were kind of, and two of them said, please help us with uh, Bugzilla. And, and one uh, person I've never met, but she's a professor uh, somewhere in the East Coast of the US, if I remember correctly, Elin Warring or something is her name. Yes. That's basically what she does. She goes over Boxilla box and and reviews them. Sometimes just saying this is still active. Oftentimes doing some real analysis in addition, like uh, looking at more cases or or showing cases where the bug doesn't show, whereas where it shows. So that's that's what we mentioned with code analysis. Trying more than just reproducing the bug, but also seeing when does it happen, when does it not happen, or, or even further down. Now that, that's very useful. And, and as Gabe mentioned, and, and I have time to say, sometimes the wish list item is really just put the wish list because it's really not the bug and nobody has time. But actually, it may be good if somebody reviews it five years later and says, well, actually, in the meantime, I've also found uh, I would want this functionality and it's kind of easy to add or whatnot. No re review of old co old bugs that are just forgotten because we don't have time can be useful. Uh, as Gabe mentioned, it, it's of course it's good to find a balance between a reminder uh, with some extra information, namely this is still current, uh, as opposed to nagging why why has this never been addressed uh, and so on. Of course, you all know that. But maybe Michael can add he has a different perspective possibly. I think I have a very similar uh, perspective. Yeah, I think uh, every any help is is good help, and I, and I think the way we can make that most effective is if we ensure that we clean up, you know, those old bugs and ensure that whatever bugs are in there are relevant, and that, and that's something that can actually also be contributed, right? I mean, just going in there and helping to find obvious cruft or or things that maybe duplicate of, of previous bugs and things like that. Uh, because I, I think kind of doing a first pass of that 
uh, would would ensure that everyone's time is well spent. Yes, I suppose it, sh it would be a good first step before implementing features, right? Just contributing to that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I mean, I don't remember how many bugs there are open, but like it's there are there are bugs open, right? Like there are there are things that you know are there, and either they're not bugs, in which case figuring out that they're not bugs is really valuable because it saves our course time trying to track them down or figuring out they are bugs and making them easier to tackle um, is really valuable. And like, you know, a lot of our users probably think, you know, like, well, R doesn't have any bugs. R has been around for, you know, so-and-so years. It's, you know, and I use it every day at my work to do, you know, to do the same thing, which is the part they don't think about as much, but, um, but really all software has bugs, right. And, you know, the, um, the way that we can improve R and help R and help the R community is by, you know, helping find new bugs and helping get rid of old bugs, but like it has bugs. So there are, there are things in there that are open and some subset of them are even real bugs. Um, that just haven't been fixed yet. And so if they haven't been fixed, that's a sign that probably some help on those, uh, you know, might help R by getting getting them closer to being fixed. Looks like so we, we have a question in the, in the chat. Okay. Uh, if, if our core team is so busy, then why not get more people to join the R core team? And I could take a, a first stab at that. I think that's what this uh, this seminar, this tutorial is is all about. Uh, so our core is is simply defined as the group of people who have commit rights to the source code, right? Uh, but that's actually a very small task in the in the, you know in the overall scope of of our development. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is have you know the our development team be much broader and much more inclusive and uh, include people at, at various levels of contribution, right? Uh, and so I, I think what we're encouraging everyone to do today is, is actually to sort of join that team, right? Uh, and collaborate with, with our core uh, and, and making our better. So that's my perspective. Uh, yeah, and so I can, I can say, uh, you know, from, you know, as having worked from the outside of, of our core, you know, just to, just to sort of add on to that, you know, I have been able to contribute um, to R. Um, I, you know, I've, I've fixed bugs and I even over the course of a long period of time and, you know, developing these, um, these relationships with our, with our core uh, members, even, even feature additions eventually, although again, that's not, that's not where we start. Right, like that's not where I started. That's not where anyone starts. Um, but I can tell you that you you can help R and you can have an impact even outside uh, of our core. And whether or not your goal is eventually to be on our core, or if you always just want to, if you don't want that sort of extra expectation and extra responsibility, you can you can you don't need to. To in order to to help R and and help R grow and you know improve and fix things fix things that are problems with it. So, um, so you can you can help without being in in our core and um, and we're encouraging you uh, if if you're interested to to do that. And hopefully this has been helpful in sort of learning some of the types of things that you would need to know in order to be effective at doing that, be, to be effective collaborators with our core in this, what Michael's calling a larger R development team that helps R and improves R um, and makes things better for, for our users everywhere. So we do have a few more minutes if there are any, and it doesn't have to even be related to, to collaborations, right? This is a open round table. If you have questions that you've wondered um, that you've never had a chance to ask to an R-Core member uh, before, 
this is a chance to, to do that. Uh, and if you have any questions for me as a non encore member, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about basically anything as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, please uh, feel free. Um, there's no, you know, there's no stupid questions. If, if there's something that you don't know, you can, you can just ask. I do have a question, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, well, it's it's not highly related to the topics we covered today. But uh, now that we have Michael on the call, uh, I I think it's it's okay to ask. And this is something that came up yesterday. I think one of the lowest barriers to entry to contribute to R might be translations, and there I think it would be much easier to do those contributions via a web service so that you do not even have to check out from subversion and then do uh, text edits and then run the tests and then email the patch to someone and then get it uh, checked into subversion. So I, I know a long time ago, there was this portal server where anyone could just register, log in, provide some translations, others could review it. And after, let's say, one or two reviews, those could be committed to uh, the actual code base. Not sure if there are any related plans. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for bringing that up again. Yeah, so we, uh, we just learned about this at the at the translation tutorial, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Gurgly, uh, because uh, you know this is something, I guess, that uh, uh, Brian Ripley had put into place about a decade ago uh, for facilitating uh, submission of, of translations in, into the R code base. And we, uh, we uh, you know, somehow that that has uh, fallen off the radar. Um, and uh, so what we'd like to do as part of this overarching effort towards improving um, translations, towards improving the translation process, building up the translation community, uh, and making it one of these on ramps, you know, to our contribution uh, is, you know, we have this we have this working group um, sponsored, but with zero funding by by the R consortium, uh, where Michael Chirico and and I and and others that we will recruit into our effort uh, are gonna are gonna pursue um, that uh, that very topic. You know, how how can we make this easier? The technical perspective. Uh, you know, from the community perspective, uh, and and so that's a it's really great to uh, to learn about that Poodle server. I think that'll be a a useful piece of technology for us. And and certainly, if anybody here, you know, uh, including you, Gurgly, like if you're if you're interested in joining that working group, just uh, you know, let Michael Chirico or I know. I'd be happy to have you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have another question uh, in the chat. Uh, so Luis uh, is asking. Uh, so Michael mentioned that there is a, that there, but there is a lot more um, tasks that our core members perform besides changing the source code of R. Um, so uh, so they as a as a small small point of. Uh, so our core doesn't maintain CRAN. CRAN is a separate but related entity uh, to our core. Uh, but there's also the the website and Bugzilla and the servers, and those are under the purview of of our core. So he's asking how we can contribute uh, on those other types of tasks um, beyond just the source code. So I, I have heard other people sort of lament the um, the the website not being sort of more modern and wondering how a modernization of the website might be contributed so that I, I've heard that in the wild as well so if, if Martin or Michael wants to talk about that that would be great yeah I mean a general a general statement I would make I guess is just that you know we'd like to collaborate with whoever has the energy and interest uh, in contributing these things I mean so approaching us as as collaborators if you have a new idea for the website I mean I think as Gabe was saying in a lot of these slides come come to it with a with an attitude and a disposition of you know I want to start small and, and work um, with you know our core uh, towards towards some common end and then I think we can build up that that relationship that collaboration and, and work towards a, a better thing I mean so you know we're totally open in principle 
to improvements to all of those things. Uh, and so uh, one, one of the things we have done, uh, practical things, is this uh, Serenji Core has written up this R, contribu R Contribution Guide or R Developer's Guide um, along with, um, with Heather. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's one practical place to start if you're looking to see how to get involved. But that, that's just my general point is just around, you know, approach this as a collaboration and I think it'll be fruitful. Thank you, Martin, you had something to add? Uh, I, I noticed that I'm almost not, I mean, almost losing Zoom connection, maybe because I'm I'm on the same Zoom uh, for VTH as, as most of the conference Zoom surrounds. Uh, the bandwidth is very limited, even though it cannot be at my home. Uh, so I'm, I'm sketchy, I never see the chat, for instance. Uh, yes, uh, the website, what people are not aware of, there are two websites. There is the, the R project web, uh, which is all based on Markdown, which we really like, and we don't want to change anything of that. I mean, of that part of the interface. And then there's Cron, and Cron is mirrored to about 30 different places, or even 50, I don't remember. And, and the Cron website is, is much more old-fashioned than the R1, uh, because the, the www, uh, our project org, does work nicely on smartphones and so on. It doesn't have to look like, like a, a website that has a team of people working full-time for the maintenance, because we don't afford that and don't want to. And we don't want to, to go to a completely commercial hosting. Also, we want to use free software and, and host our own stuff as much as reasonable, of course. So that's a bit, there are some constraints, but the main problem is that, um, the, yeah, I think that that we have two websites instead of one, namely CRAN, which is mirrored, and, and, uh, and the R project website, which is just one place that uses modern, relatively modern bootstrap uh, technology for, for reactivity and, and uses Markdown as a source code, which makes the maintenance reasonable for us, because in the end, it's us who, who change. Uh, yeah. But as Michael said, we have often talked about how to ask, have other people do, the, do this in, in collaboration with us, and, and often, well, efforts have started and often have gone nicely and not so many have really happened in this part of the web page. Uh, it's, it's not that we would want to move to some commercial web host that, that does some extra whistles. And then I think people don't understand sometimes that free software is a very important thing and R and Python too would never have happened if 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 there if there was not free software and open source is just one part of free as you hopefully know and that's why some of us and i'm one of them very much emphasize that we don't want to commercialize our complete infrastructure and be dependent on on, on people who who need to make money and instead of advancing a free free thing as R is. yeah and I, I just one thing to add on top of that is that the web the website even in its current state, is a lot, a lot better than it once was, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons for that uh, is it was actually a, a collaboration. Uh, so I think you know Hadley and, and other a few other people actually came together to refactor the website about five or six years ago, uh, and so now mm -hmm. it's actually you know template based and things like that. So I mean those types of improvements can happen and have happened. I think that is uh, that's the time uh, that we had. Um, Heather also just mentioned that in the chat, but uh, we are at 30 after. So thanks everyone uh, for for attending and for sticking sticking with it to the end. Um, and hopefully this has been useful uh, and fun for people. Um, and like I said, uh, there's the developer guide and the the Slack, uh, the R contributions working group Slack that uh, that you can join. Um, and I encourage you to join and I encourage you to, um, you know, do all the, all the things that we, that we talked about. Um, and hopefully I will be seeing you guys, you know, around in, in those types of places as, 
those things move forward. So mm -hmm. thanks again. Thanks to Martin for working with me uh, on this. And thanks to Michael for, for attending uh, for this last bit for the, for the um, sort of open question section. Uh, and with that, I think we can stop the recording and uh, uh, I hope everyone has a good day or night.